welcome to episode number 14 of the Eliza Licious Show. I'm your host, Eliza Jankowski, a business administration student, yoga teacher, marathon runner, and currently finishing my plant based nutritionist degree. I'm here to help you to achieve a healthier, happier, and more sustainable life. I'm also the creator of the Eliza Licious Show Instagram account, where I post delicious and nutritious plant based recipes. If you haven't checked it out, please do so. That's at Eliza Licious Show over on Instagram. I hope you all have a wonderful week of good vibes and I'm so grateful that you're tuning in with me today. So let's get started. A couple of weeks ago, I was working for on at the art run here in Berlin and there were so many lovely people and I truly enjoyed the time there. And one of the wonderful people is Eliana. She is such a sunshine. She's smiling all the time, super positive, And I was simply super inspired by her personality. And not just that, she's also a right Berlin instructor. And I always wanted to go to a cycling class, so I actually became a member for Urban Sports just a couple of seconds ago. And that means that I will try that soon. Can't wait to share this conversation with you. So let's jump right into it. Hello, I'm super excited to have someone really special on the show today. Hello. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> My name is Aliena. And um, I am a ride expert at Ride Berlin. And I'm super happy to be here too. Thank you for the invitation. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait to chat with you about you and Ride Berlin. First of all, where are you from and where are you currently located? Okay, so I am half German. I have a German mother and I have a British father. But I was actually born in Singapore. Whoa, that's yeah. far. <laughs> yeah, a little bit far away from here. Uh, but we were living in Indonesia at the time. And uh, with my parents growing up, we would move country every three or four years. So I grew up in lots of different places. And wow. then when I left home, I kept traveling and I kept moving around. So actually now I think I've lived in more countries by myself than I did with my parents. <laughs> yeah, it's just, you know, when it's in you, you keep going. And um, But now I'm in Berlin and I've been here since the beginning of 2018. So this January coming up will be three years. So are you going to stay or do you want to move? Who knows? <laughs> Ask me again in a year, you know? Um, it's hard to say. It's really difficult for me. I... I like it. Now I, I like it. I feel like I'm surrounded by people I want to be surrounded by. I feel like I'm finding my feet. It took me a while. I It wasn't somewhere where I arrived and immediately felt settled. Um, it's a big city and I'm not such a big city girl. I mean, you know, well, I, I Singapore, sort of, <laughs> Singapore. Yeah, but Singapore, it's a small place still. It's it's. It's not this like hustle and bustle of yeah, okay. New York, for yeah, example, or London. or. But I spent most of my time in cities with about half a million people. Okay. So for me to then be in a six million plus city, it's a lot. I mean, somewhere like Mexico City or Istanbul, forget it. That is yeah, just yeah. way too many people. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, but no, Berlin is good. And, and I like how diverse it is. And I like the juxtaposition of Berlin. I like that all of these opposites are clashing all the time, but then they're not clashing, right? And it's this really exciting place. And um, I recently bought a bike and now I'm cycling everywhere. <laughs> and I love it because in 30 minutes, you can cycle through four or five different neighborhoods and it really feels like you've cycled through four or five different cities, but it's all Berlin. And I feel like the cycling is giving me a new perspective on the city. And that's really helped me like it a bit more and, and feel more comfortable with it rather than spending all your time underground using the U and the S bahn. Yeah, you don't see anything. No, exactly. Yeah. You don't and you don't see how the city connects to all the different parts. So so that's been really nice. If it's my forever, I don't know. I don't really say that anywhere is my forever because I don't know any different. I don't know what it's like to live somewhere for more than five years. So 
ask me again in a year or two years and I can tell you how I'm feeling then. <laughs> did, did you know anyone in Berlin before you came? I knew one person. Um, no, sorry, I knew two. A family friend, mm -hmm. uh, a friend of my mother's and, and then an old colleague actually. And he's still living in Berlin now. So, But apart from that, no, didn't know anybody. And I'd only been to visit one time before. And um, admittedly didn't get the best impression of the city. So I was a bit nervous about coming because I wasn't convinced by it. But I came because my master's program was actually continuing here. So the whole reason was actually because I had to be here. What did you study? So I studied, it was a master's in, it sounds a lot fancier than it is, but it's international events and cultural diplomacy. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. And it's basically a fancy way of saying how countries use their cultural products. And that can be sport, events, music, food, uh, anything to do with their culture and how they um, sometimes manipulate, sometimes for propaganda, obviously, but mostly use in a positive way to enhance their relationships with other countries. So they'll do cultural exchanges or they'll do um, things like the FIFA World Cup, what hosting the FIFA World Cup means for not only the reputation of the country, but how they can improve their relationships. And it's the same with the Olympic Games, for example, or the Handball World Championships or things like that. So the focus was always on sports, mostly. Um, and I'm fascinated by the topic, still am. And um, the first semester actually was in Scotland. That's where the whole program started. And then the second semester was in Berlin. And we could write our thesis remotely. We could do it from anywhere. But I decided to stay in Berlin because for my topic, it was great. And then uh, before I handed in my thesis, I found a job. And then I just stayed. And that was it. So it wasn't an active choice to say, okay, I want to stay in Berlin. Um, but it's just kind of how it happened and I have to say I'm, I'm happy it happened that way so can't change it now <laughs> sounds super amazing because I had the same idea I wanted to study abroad mm -hmm. all the time but due to the pandemic they cancelled all of my yeah. plans but I mean I'm fine with that yeah. what kind of what kind of job do you do when you finish this study so I was actually quite lucky because I found a job that actually had something to do with my master's <laughs> I feel like a lot of people you know they study something and they end up working in something completely different like oh I studied geology and now I'm in finance <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> um, no but I was actually very very lucky and what I found most fascinating about the master's degree was that um, there's this whole political game that goes on behind these big events, right? There's a whole bidding process. And actually, if a city wants to host something like the World Cup or uh, the Olympic Games, they must bid. Sometimes the bidding process starts 20 years before they actually host. So it's funny because the bid, the whole process will begin and the government will be completely different by the time the games are actually in town. Oh God. <laughs> so there's this whole process that goes on behind it and it's fascinating I I think it's fascinating um and then actually I was looking around and I found this company they're called Piranha Arts and they're actually the productions partner behind the Carnaval de Kulturen okay so they're very active in the cultural scene in Berlin but actually that's not even the main thing that they do what they do and spend most of their time on is that throughout the course of a year they organize two big music events and they're B2B expos and there's a showcase festival and a trade fair and a conference that goes with it one is for classical music classical contemporary which we refer to as art music <laughs> um, and the other one is for world music and the world music expo we call it womex also has a little bit of this uh, bidding process behind it because it changes location every year and it goes all around europe we only stay within the european union But, of course, the cities bid to host Womex. And um, to think that there was a company in Berlin and I could actually be up close to working with um, more than a festival. I mean, really a, a cultural event. And it's, it's, a, it's an event where the host city has the opportunity to stand on stage because the host city will then organize the opening. And that's a chance for them to display their music, and show their culture and their costumes and everything around it. And you get to travel there and 3,000 people come and, and they do their music business. But 
it's not people walking around in suits it's people walking around in costume or they're playing their music and they bring their instruments with them and so I was very lucky to find something that actually let me connect what I'd studied what I'd been passionate about studying and then bring it into yeah the workspace I think it's much more fun when you can continue what you love yeah and especially when you find a field that you love and mm -hmm. when you find something where you can put your work in and you actually like what you do yeah. because I think this is a huge problem in our society nowadays that people don't like their job and they don't like what they do so yeah. props to you that you found something that you like yeah but I have one question yeah due to the current situation how did your job or how did your life change yeah well music events <laughs> yeah that <that's, laughs> wasn't great was it yeah. no um so admittedly now within the company We have a Womex team and we have the Classical Next team. Classical Next referring to the art music event. And I am actually more on the classical side of things. I studied classical music. That was my bachelor's. What kind of instrument can you play? So my main is piano Ooh, and I played flute nice. and clarinet in the orchestra. And then I self-taught guitar and I like... I try and sing with the guitar. <laughs> we should we should meet at some point because I used to play piano and yeah? violin. Yeah. Oh, nice. Uh, I actually have a violin and a guitar in my basement. Oh, really? Yeah. Don't put it in the basement. Bring it up here. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out where to put everything yeah. because I want to get a piano for the other room. So yeah. I need to figure everything out. But Oh, nice. nice. Yeah, then I'll come back over. Yeah. <laughs> Finn can teach you guitar. Yeah. <laughs> we will make our own like music exactly. podcast. <laughs> It'll be the Elisa band. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so I'm, I'm actually more on the classical side of things, um, which is also very interesting. It's very different. The whole industry is completely different compared to the world music scene. Mm -hmm. um, so what happened was on the 13th of March, that date is just forever ingrained in me now, we got the news that we had to postpone the event and the classical event always takes place in may so really it was two months before and we were going to have the event in rotterdam and um you know it was sort of all systems go full steam ahead and all of a sudden halting stop and what we really wanted to do was preserve as much of the program as possible to move to 2021 but then we decided why don't we try and do something digital And it was very, very different back then because we had no idea what was going on. We didn't know how long it was going to last. No one understood lockdown. Everything was so uncertain. So actually, what we ended up putting together for, for our digital Classical Next came together quite nicely. I mean, very stressful, very, I mean, everything happened last minute. We just sort of skipped all the team meetings, trusted each other and said, do this, do that, do this, make it happen. We worked long hours. I mean, um, we were able to produce something at the end of it. Now we're in that situation with Womex. Womex is supposed to start on the 21st of October. But I find that it's a very different situation now because we're into, what, month seven of this? And no one wants to be sitting in front of a computer anymore. I mean, to do a digital event now has to be stellar to really attract the people. Um... So it's a huge learning curve that the company is going through. It's, um, yeah, I, pff, I don't think there's a, there's a recipe for it. I think this whole situation calls for strong decision making. And even if it's not the right decision, you keep going with it or you decide, okay, crap, that was not good. Change direction and try something else. But it's the time to experiment. It's the time to try something new. And... Um, I've partially liked it because of the opportunity to try all of these new things. And I've partially really not enjoyed it because of the chaos and how disorganized things can be and this this tearing out of your hair and thinking, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? There's no solution. No one's making decisions. We're not moving forward. And you just think... Wow, how are we going to get through this? And then, I don't know, you wake up the next day and you, you either have a day of chaos or you have a day where you think, oh no, this was a good one because we, we managed to go one step further. And, um, but how my life has changed, I just work from home now. <laughs> um, I no longer have my colleagues sitting next to me anymore. 
the coffee breaks are much shorter because there's no one to talk to in the kitchen. Um, but admittedly, I have to say I've really enjoyed it. I've actually um, really, really enjoyed having a bit more time in the day. I didn't realize how much stress commuting was, right? I mean, you think about it, you have two hours of the day before your day even begins of thinking about, okay, you're going to have, you get ready, maybe you do a bit of sport, then you get ready, then you have breakfast, then you have to think about what you're going to wear, then you have to think about all the things that you have to take with you all day, then you have to get there, right? And this was all before I had a bicycle as well. <laughs> so then I'm on the S-Bahn and uh, maybe the S-Bahn is late and then you're walking across or alongside a really busy street and it's just stress, 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 all your senses are going crazy, but you don't realize what a toll that takes on you until you stop doing it, until you remove all of these things. Mm. And... I really just enjoyed not having to commute anymore. I really have to say that. And also that you could wake up and change your routine a little bit. You could work in your pajamas for an hour and then shower and then have breakfast and then continue working. Or you could shower in the middle of the day and you could really be exotic, right? <laughs> and um, I just enjoyed it. I've really just getting a little bit of time back in the day and um, realizing what's important to you and uh, realigning your priorities so... And I, I count myself very lucky to be able to say that because I know it's not the same for everybody. That's true. I can absolutely understand that. But I have to ask you, what is important for you now? What is important for me? Or what, did you, what did you learn within this crisis? Yeah. I mean, you said that a lot of things changed, but is there something in particular that, that you can point out? Yeah, for sure. Well, um, two big things happened. Um, One was, I'm someone who loves working. I really like working. Not to the point of burnout, of course, but I am someone who will give 150% on the job because I don't like how it feels when you don't give 150% on the job. I like engaging in the things I do. I like being present. I like being there. I like thinking things through. I like having an idea and people thinking the idea is good and then rolling with it and seeing if you can bring it to life. Um, but what I realized was I was putting a lot of that effort into places where it wasn't being not necessarily rewarded, but it wasn't even being recognized. Okay. And that very very quickly tires you out and you suddenly feel very undervalued and you suddenly feel like you start questioning why am I doing this and that's not a nice feeling and so from a work perspective I've started to really not calculate every step but really think about two three steps ahead and think okay, what effect will that have? What good does it do? Does it, and is it worth me getting stressed out about it? And I think it's just, it's a little bit of growing up in the workplace and recognizing, okay, I'm allowed to be a little bit selfish about this because actually, you know, especially now with internships that don't get paid anymore, people expecting people to work for free all the time or on minimum wage, that's just not right. As far as I'm concerned, internships should never be unpaid, ever. You're totally abusing somebody, somebody's talents. And actually, you're asking them to give you time and day and um, thought process and the education that they've worked towards for nothing. And the number of times we, we say yes and we agree to these things because we think we'll get contacts out of it or, oh, it looks good on my CV, Fun fact, hardly anyone reads the CV anymore, right? I mean, people get a job because they know somebody or because they're passionate about it, not because a piece of paper says that you had three months of experience and did something and, yeah, got no money for it, right? And I think I've just really learned in the last couple of months that being a little bit selfish and actually allowing yourself to be first every now and then it's okay to do. And I think that goes for a lot of things, right? 
And tied in with all of that, then I had the luxury of not losing my job, knock on wood, <laughs> and um, going through this Kurzarbeit scheme. So actually, we had to reduce hours. We were legally required to reduce our hours, right? And so I had Fridays free all of a sudden. And there was this opportunity to audition at Ride Berlin. And I thought, I'm going to do that. I'm going to try that out. And it's probably the best thing I've done in years. And that being said, what's important to me, and I didn't even realize it at the time, was at school, I played sports all the time. And uh, I love team sports, ball sports, anything with hand-eye coordination. I love it, right? And I mean, give me a pom-pom. I'm your, I'm your cheerleader. <laughs> I'm there, you know? And... Um, I didn't realize how much I missed sport being so much part of my life and and actually at such a high level of sport. I mean, yeah, you can go to the gym, you can go for a jog in the morning, but it's not the same thing. It's when you when you have a high level of sport, when you have to perform to a certain level, when when there's an uh, a program that's really intense and I a little bit cliche but it it brought me back to me brought me back to life a little bit because I was so motivated to do it and I was so happy to have sport be more central so yeah I would say that those are the two things that probably stand out the most from this whole time okay you know what's coming what is ride Berlin ah, <laughs> there it is ride Berlin <laughs> ride feel good uh, ride Berlin is a, a dedicated studio for spinning um, for cycling indoor cycling and they now have three studios the third studio just opened in September and we have one in Charlottenburg one in Mitte and one in Prenzlauer Berg and it's every day of the week um, sometimes three rides sometimes four five six rides a day 50 minutes of indoor cycling in a dark room um, with two candles in front And um, it's really just a space for you to have so much fun while getting a really intense workout. It's full body. It's not just the legs. Um, it really is. You move your upper body. There's a weight section. Um, and it's a HIT training, high intensity interval training. And um, the key thing is that you leave that room and you feel good. And, and that's what we try to do. And so I'm an expert there. And our main goal is to make sure that you, of course, get through the 50 minutes <laughs> injury-free, right? But of course, um, that you leave uh, feeling better than you did when you walked in and that you can take that energy with you for the rest of the day. Okay, what does expert mean? Expert is um, the Ride Berlin term for being the spinning instructor. Okay, nice. I also read something about a rough rider. Yes. <laughs> What is that? It so a rough really rider <laughs> refers to clients. It's nothing about how intensely you sit on the saddle. <laughs> um, no, a rough rider is someone who does four rides in one week. Okay. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. Do you, have you done it before? I have done it. Um, how did you feel afterwards? Pretty rough. <laughs> I have to say. Um, no, it's uh, because you can buy, like the way the, the packages are set up for how you can purchase rides, you can buy single rides or you can buy a package of it. And um, there's, there's a deal involved with doing the four rides and... Um, it's intense. I mean, I would obviously teaching now I, I do back to back, back to back, meaning, um, uh, one day after the other, some people do two rides in one day though, for example. So some people come in the morning and again in the evening, or they do one at seven and immediately again at eight. Um, some people do Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, they take the Wednesday off, you know, w whatever combination works for you. Uh, just make sure that you uh, listen to your body. That's what we that's what we always say because sometimes you you're feeling really strong and you think, yeah, I'm gonna go for it. Do it, you know. See it. Test yourself. See if you can pull through. It doesn't have to be the best ride of your life, but um, it's a stamina thing. It's an endurance thing, and a, very much a mental thing too. Just getting through it and saying, I want to do this. I want to see if I can do it, 
And um, I think most of the rough riders, if you speak to them, maybe the ones doing it for the first time are, whew, they're pretty tired at the end of it. <laughs> But we have we have people who really keep it up, and we the names go up on the board. So when you walk into the studio as a rough rider, you get acknowledged as a rough rider. Oh wow! <laughs> and um, there's little numbers next to the names, and then those numbers they refer to the number of weeks in a row that they have been a rough rider. So that means every week. Do you, Do you know the score at the moment? Like the. I believe uh, the leader, she's miles ahead of everybody. She is un unbelievable. I don't even know how she's managed to do it. Uh, I, I think she's at 152 or something. I mean, really wow. phenomenal. Really phenomenal. Yeah. Oh, that's crazy. Okay. As a runner slash outdoor cyclist, yeah. why cycling indoors? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why? <laughs> well, okay. So... Firstly, it's it's a it's a fixed bike, right? So you're, and you don't have to worry about any of the aerodynamics. So you can really turn that. We work with the resistance dial, right? And it it means that you can get this cardio that that's underlying the entire time because your legs are moving nonstop. But you build a little bit of strength training on top of it, and. By doing all of the movements at the same time, that's something that a bike in motion doesn't allow you to do, right? I mean, if you're cycling on the road, first you would need a hill <laughs> or um, sort of a rougher surface, for example. You'd need to make sure that you weren't in a wind corridor. Um, and obviously on a racing bike, for example, you have to really bend down, right? To make sure, oops, sorry, <laughs> to make sure that the... Uh, that you fight against the wind and that you keep your balance yeah. on a fixed bike you don't have to worry about that the only thing that you, to to keep your balance and to keep your stability is making sure that you have enough resistance under you and that your core is working but um, you don't have to consider all of these external factors and obviously you don't have to worry about a car coming out of nowhere or another cyclist right so yeah. you can actually just get a workout for yourself and the flat tire And a flat tire, oh my God. No, we don't want that. No, no, no. Um, there's technically no tires on the spin bike, yeah, right? Yeah. So um, it's really just um, for people who really enjoy cycling, but want it to be a bit more of a workout. Mm. It's the perfect thing. But also, um, I think you can't really compare it to any other exercise either. I find I went for a run last week and the muscle pain I had the next day from running, considering how much spinning I do and how much I use my legs, it targets a totally different group of muscles. And I think it's good to, to obviously keep up variation just because your body gets tired of always doing the same movement. Um, but it's really, it's really unique in the sense that it's, it's hard cardio, but we, we include the weights, we include this upper body movement And so we really, you know, we're pumping oxygen into our lungs all the time. We're, we're alternating between really quick legs that brings the heart rate all the way back up and then turning that resistance up and really slowing down, but focusing on stability and engaging the core and pushing those pedals down. And that's something that the, the moving bike isn't built for, right? The, it's moved, it's there to get you from A to B. That's yeah. the first point. And then, of course, mountain biking is different. And then road racing is totally different. And, of course, they, they serve different purposes. But it's in and of itself a completely different workout. I'm actually a bit confused because I can't imagine to have weights in my hand or somewhere on my body while mm -hmm. cycling. So how do you do your weight? Right, that? yeah. So um, the, the bikes are custom built where they, there's a place where the weights stay while you're not using them mm -hmm. and we bring our legs to a standstill when we do the weight section okay yeah okay. so then you sit and you have one leg straight one leg bent and then you grab the weights and then that's just for the arms it's just a okay. dedicated arms weight section yeah okay i was just wondering how can i uh, yeah no <laughs> my gosh coordination is hard as it is right left right arms and everything and then coming down over the handlebar and all that stuff no 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 you wouldn't want the weights to be there at the same time okay but 
how did you become an instructor there an instructor so the audition um it was advertised that they were uh, hold, holding open auditions it was okay. an open call and i was a client before i was always going to write berlin um i was in and out of it i was a bit irregular i have to say at the beginning Because when I first moved to Berlin, I was living in Mitte, just around the corner from the Mitte studio. Ooh. And actually, Ride Berlin was one of the first things I did when I arrived in Berlin. I had taken a spinning class in London years before at a place called Cycle, spelled P-S-Y-C-L-E, mm -hmm. and loved it. I mean, I thought, what is this amazing thing that I have just walked into? And funny side story, I ran into a girl I went to high school with who works there too, which is crazy. It just made the whole experience so much better. Um, but I was living in Qatar at the time and Qatar didn't have a class like that. So I couldn't really pursue it and I didn't actively get into spinning. I did spinning classes there, but they were very different. They were the ones, they had the bikes with the computers on it at the front and then they were working with RPM, which actually is counting how fast you go and then uh, the instructor will tell you get up to 100 rpm or 120 rpm but at uh, ride berlin now we don't have that we just ride to the beat of the music and mm -hmm. we, we work with bpm instead yeah, yeah um but then when i arrived in berlin it was january we all know what it's like in berlin in january it was gray it was cold um my semester hadn't started yet i didn't know anybody And I thought, oh my gosh, I wonder if there's a spinning studio in Berlin. Lo and behold, it was round the corner. And I was like, right, I'm going. <laughs> I felt so nauseous in my first ride. I was like, what am I doing here? This is so hard. But I loved it. And I went back and I kept going. It's going to um, be me like, why am I doing this? Yeah. I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to try it. No, I'm sure you're fit. You're, you'll be great. Oh, by the way, we have to mention we met each other while we were running. Yes. With um, <gasps> with an urban art run <laughs> slash awning event yeah. where we were running with Laurent through Gleis Park and all the other nice areas. Mm -hmm. I can't even remember the names, but it was so nice. Yeah. Really, Some beautiful really enjoyed art. it. Yeah. 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 So you're, you're not really a runner, you're more the cycling person. No, so it's funny. I actually, I, I mean, you know, a year ago I would have said I was a runner. Okay. Um, well, no, a year ago I would have said I wasn't much of anything sporty because I really wasn't, <laughs> I, I was really in work mode and um, I was traveling a lot for work as well. So I was keeping up exercise, but, you know, like I said before, just maybe a jog in the morning or going to the gym, but not like invested in it, not, you call not it, doing it with my how heart. How did you call it earlier? high high sp no not high sports but you had a name for it earlier um sort of what just like an intensive level of sport uh, or something with high i can't remember what it was a high level of sport yeah or yeah, yeah? I, think, i think something like that yeah mm. i mean i wasn't doing any of that because also my job didn't really allow it i didn't okay. really have the time um says everybody all the time <laughs> right because you have to make the time for these things yeah. but I, my priorities back then were different I was really focused on work I was getting ahead and I really wanted to travel with a job and um yeah and that's I mean obviously traveling is not happening this year so of yeah, course yeah. that all changed um But actually, so I used to live in Chamonix and um, in really? France. Really? Yeah, where, so where you, they have the you, ultra trail. Yeah, and did like. you see the people running there? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, gosh, um, so I, nice. I remember a couple of us, we would always jog past Killian Journey's house and be oh. like, oh my God, let's speed up. Let's oh go. <laughs> we have to run faster here. <laughs> But he's not living in Norway. Do you know that? No, exactly. Yeah, yeah he's yeah. not there anymore. I will actually have some people on the show who are winning the UTMB. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, these people... I have mad respect yeah. for I don't know how they do it I really it's unbelievable and I love it because when it's on and you look up the valley and you look at the mountain you see their headlights at night yeah. and you see these lights bobbing through the trees it's phenomenal oh I mean God. what they do yeah they are they are supermen I don't, I don't really it, it's amazing. super it's super interesting to see that when I started working for on I noticed that there were so many ultra runners around me yeah. my boss is an ultra runner yeah. one of my colleagues i know did you meet stefan the other yes. yeah he's on, yeah. He, he ran the utmb as well oh wow yeah yeah wow and i was like okay 
I think I should do that as well. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, I have said it's on my bucket list. Like before I die, I do definitely want to at least try an ultra marathon. I just don't think I'm there mentally yet. And I mean, obviously, (laughs) well, your level, your fitness level is. You're cycling at the moment. It's fine. (laughs) Yeah, and and that's good for me at the moment. (laughs) A hundred minutes of back to back cycling. That's that's already. (laughs) Then I'm I'm I can sleep well after I've done that, right? But I mean, a hundred minutes. These guys in minutes, I don't even know, but. they run for what is it like 25 hours a long time yeah I but mean, how far is it 100 and or is it more than it's 160 kilometers yeah. it's 100 yeah. miles wow yeah and that's so utmb is the longest one and yeah. then they have the ccc yeah. and they have one ccc other is one 100 or kilometers yeah yeah kilometers yeah. Sorry, yeah 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 um but then, of course, being around that and being at the event, I got into running in Chamonix and I loved it because the trails are beautiful. Oh and um, I have to say I had Hoka 1s, not Ooh. on shoes. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I do like my Hoka 1s. Yeah. Um, I was running in Nike trail shoes before. Yeah. So I get that. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't tried Hoka yet, though. Yeah. No, I really... And I like, don't think it's going to happen. Uh, no. No, no, no. <laughs> um... And I really got into it there. And then actually I found in Doha, so I lived in Doha after Chamonix. And in Doha, there's a lot of desert runners, but I'm not so good in the heat, Mm. says the girl that lived in Qatar for two and a half years. (laughs) But the heat, I really, really struggle with. Mm. So then when I was in Doha, I was really back in the gym and and doing all of that stuff. So um, my focus up until the ride audition really was always a little bit more on the running side of things. Um, but now of course I'm totally into the spinning and then like I said before getting the bicycle it's changed everything it's like it's given me a new perspective on Berlin even and I'm so excited to just be able to cycle everywhere and when it's as glorious as it is you know on a weekend like we're having now it's just amazing and what kind of bike did you get um, so this is a really cool story so how I ended up being at Finn's event the, at the TSP yeah, is through my friend no through my friend Flo <laughs> and Flo is by trade a sound engineer yeah but he's got a bit of a thing for uh, vintage female racing bikes <laughs> I, which, need, I need to contact you <laughs> right yeah which he collects and I on that day I actually had planned to go to a bicycle store because at that point, I really just wanted a bicycle to get me around because also with COVID, I don't want to be on public transport anymore. I just think Ugh, it's kind of gross and I hate wearing a mask. I, you know, I know I do it, of course, but when you have to wear it for over an hour sometimes, why? Well, it just really, I just don't like it. And if I have the choice to be on a bicycle and cycling through and no mask and breathing in the fresh air, fresh in the city, I know. <laughs> um, it's just I would I would always pick that option. So I was um, wanting to get a bicycle, and at that point, admittedly, I don't know mechanics of a bicycle. I really I'm don't the know same. the details of that, right? But I knew Flo knows much more compared to me, and I said, "So what? What should I ask for? Like, what are some of the key questions when buying a bicycle? Can you give me some advice?" And he said, well, what are you looking for? Na, na, na. And, he, and he said, look, I can do you one better. I've got a bicycle. Um, it's the second bicycle that I, I bought from my girlfriend, actually. But it's just sitting around. It's not in use. I can sell it to you for the price I bought it for secondhand. And I'll fix it up for you. So he ordered all the parts. And he did it for me. And it's so beautiful. And I'm so happy with it. Oh, that's so nice. And it's blue, which is great. You can see I wear a lot of blue as well. So it's just, And my Hoka 1s are blue too. And it's perfect. So I'm so pleased and I'm so happy with it. And it's a Peugeot uh, vintage, super cool ladies racing bike with the gears on the stem, you know? Oh, wow. Okay. Like really like old school style nice. super cool have you been riding it for like a real bike ride mm-hmm. already yeah oh How my god it? and it right oh my god it's just so nice <laughs> it's so nice um i love it yeah 
I I mean you can you can see me smiling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope that the people listening can hear me smiling. <laughs> it's just it's a it's a real sense of of freedom a little bit when you sit on a bike and yeah, and yeah. I mean Berlin is perfect because you have also just in the city itself these huge boulevards and um, I had a real moment at sunset the other day cycling down and then like the sun was hitting the, the anger, you know, and it just mm. caught the light perfectly. I mean, you really feel like you're in a movie all of a sudden and your hair is blowing behind you and you've got this oh, playlist yes. in your ears and you just think, oh, yeah. I always have this moment this when good. I cross the Warsaw Straße yeah. because there's a huge bridge and you always see a beautiful sunset. Yeah, And especially when I was working with on at the art run mm. when i was going home sometimes i saw the sunset and i was mm. just like oh my god this yeah. is perfect yeah you just have Love these it. little moments and and you connect with the city completely differently i yeah. find yeah but i have to admit that i prefer to cycle outside of the city because of the traffic lights and all that stuff because i get really annoyed by them mm. Simply because I grew up in a suburb of Berlin mm -hmm. and there you can just go and you have one traffic light on the whole way and you cycle for 70 kilometers or yeah. something. And Amazing. here it's just like two seconds and you have the next traffic light and another one and yeah. it's not going to stop. Yeah. But and yeah. actually, you know, at the beginning I was a little bit timid. Like I said before, big cities also not really my thing. Mm. And the idea when I first arrived of cycling in a city like Berlin where everyone on a bike just looks like a professional when you first arrive right um it wasn't even so much about being intimidated by the cars it was more about the other cyclists and that you know <laughs> if i'm at the beginning and i'm not so fast and i'm getting in people's way then they shout at me and then i'm more nervous or you know these big intersections how you cross mm. them and stuff and of course the more you do it the the more confidence you build but all these all these insecurities that run through your head a little bit and you think oh my god there's gonna be an accident because of me <laughs> <laughs> but i'm over that now but i do you cycle with a helmet i do oh yes yes that's good good girl yeah, safety <laughs> first yeah. <laughs> yeah i'm always trying to encourage others to put a helmet on the head yeah because i don't i don't cycle without a helmet anymore it's especially here it's so dangerous yeah so yeah. dangerous not just because of me but also because of the others yeah and those tram lines <laughs> <laughs> hate them I hate them so much <laughs> yeah okay i have to come back to ride berlin because yes. as you know i haven't been riding indoors yes and i'm wondering i mean i like to cycle mm -hmm. but i don't really do like fast cycling i just have one gear yeah can i follow around if i'm a beginner like, yes in a class yes. yes and that's the thing so um it's a dark room first and foremost if you're in the front row which no newbie really does you can take the second row or the third row even if you're sitting in the third row it's pitch black and the instructor can't even see you and it really is a workout for you and you take it as you want to take it the only thing that we say is keep the legs moving because it's just so important that the circulation keeps going because that makes you dizzy if you suddenly stop and um, you definitely don't want that happening, yeah. right? Um, and we ride to the beat. And if you can stick to the beat for the 50 minutes, you've already done a phenomenal job because there's so much coordination in there and it goes fast and then it slows down and you're working with the resistance and you think... There's so much happening at the same time. Just right, left, right, left, right? It's like putting one foot in front of the other. Just keep walking forward. You just push one pedal down, follow by the other. No one is looking at you. And no one knows how much resistance you've actually put in. So if you think, oh my gosh, wow, this is way too much. I want to turn the resistance down. You can do that. And no one's going to stop you. No one's even going to know. The only person who knows, it's you. And it's your workout at the end of the day. So it depends on how much you want to push yourself, how much you want to exert. Um, but there's nothing about your first ride that is supposed to be scary. Everything that's scary about it is really just in your head a little bit. And... Um, but it's the same thing. It's like when you, when you go on a treadmill, you think, oh my gosh, there's this thing that keeps moving under my feet. Can I do this? It's a little bit weird. You put one foot in front of the other and you figure it out. And that's exactly what spinning is. And, um, 
a little bit of, you know, sometimes people give too much gas at the beginning and they run out of steam quite quickly. Um, that can happen, of course. And um, some people feel a little bit nauseous because of the speed and because of the intensity of it. Yeah, yeah. Especially if your first ride is in the summer when it gets so hot outside, oh, yeah. right? Um, but you can sit down and take a break whenever you want. And that's the beauty of it being a dark room as well. Yeah. Why the dark room? Can you, do you know anything about it? It gives it this atmosphere that I don't even know how to describe. It, it's, um, it, it feels a little bit like a safety blanket while also giving you the club atmosphere at the same time because we have this stellar sound system in there as well and the music is super loud and the lights are going and um, there'll be moments where you know we could put the disco lights on for example <laughs> for a sprint yeah. and then they go off again and it's really like you're you, and it, it makes you focus on the beat it brings you into that room it's um It, because it's it's black everywhere and it's all encompassing then the door shuts and you're in and you you get this you get a little bit of an adrenaline pump it's like when you walk into a nightclub and you hear the doof, doof, yeah, doof, yeah, yeah. You, you get a little bit tingly i don't know do you get that i <laughs> yeah, get that I know what you mean i know what you mean and it's it's kind of like that and and that music turns up the bass comes in the drums kick the synth comes and you think okay yeah i'm awake i'm here i'm ready i'm i want to do this and and you get this little adrenaline rush and um yeah and and the whole the whole ethos of it is that you can also everything that's outside the door you leave it there mm. this is your space this is a space where you whatever work stress you have relationship stress whatever it might be that you're going through. You might be having a great day, but that great day, it's outside and it's not in that black box of yeah. a room. Oh, that's no. it's so different. I mean, as a runner, you're outside all the time yeah. and you don't really think about the things that could happen inside, especially when, I mean, I never thought about it. That's, that's the funniest thing. I never thought about it that something like this could happen exist mm. somewhere yeah and when you were talking about it when we first met i was like well this this is actually quite interesting but i said to myself i'm gonna try it when the weather is not so beautiful like it is yes. at the moment yeah yeah i always do these things in the winter time i like to go like bouldering and stuff like that mm. but yeah i said to myself this year is yeah. gonna be the year that i'm gonna try it yeah and Yeah, but when when do you teach? Where do you teach? Where can we where can we find you when we want to so come? So I'm to normally class? in Charlottenburg. Mm -hmm. That's my regular studio. I teach Fridays at twelve thirty and Saturdays at eleven twenty. Those are my two regular slots. And uh, when I can, I'll I'll help substitute. We're all a team. We help each other out. Um, and then sometimes I'm in Mitte also, but mostly Charlottenburg. Okay, and how many instructors are you in total? We're quite a lot at the moment. We're about, I think the number right now is 35 or 36. Oh, wow. That's long. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I think I'm going to try your class before I go. To oh, I hope you do. <laughs> I would love to have you. But I think just quickly as a comparison, just going back to what you said before about when you're, when you're outside, you're always moving and mm -hmm. your surroundings keep changing. But I think if you think about it in the sense that if you were running outside and and staying in the same position, I think being in a dark room, you no longer think about the fact that you're staying in one place. Yeah. And it removes that element. And I think if it was a brightly lit room, which is what you get at, at um, spinning classes in gyms, for example, mm -hmm. they are very, very different because that setting isn't really meant for St staying in the same spot the whole time yeah, and yeah. it's very very focused on on cardio and quick legs but you you lose the fun the yeah but you also lose that upper body workout okay. you lose the the you you don't have this opportunity to let that music run through you because other senses are still reacting to light or the mirrors or someone walking in or i don't know what what can happen mm -hmm. but in a ride berlin room because it's black that door doesn't open if if you need to leave the room that's the only time the door opens until the class is finished mm. um 
you are a hundred percent focused on what you're doing on the bike and and i think that's the key difference to to doing it somewhere else or to cycling outside of course yeah, yeah. i also have to ask something i think some listeners out there are quite interested in how you deal with this whole pandemic pandemic situation mm -hmm. at the moment in the yeah. class is there anything different or? yeah yeah um well the the studio is actually shut for a while okay uh, at the beginning so and, they couldn't keep up the the stride for the rough rider um no so what happened was they had they released an on-demand program so the the instructors were filmed and then you can do a ride from home and ride berlin gave clients the option of renting bikes ah. to have in their living room wow that's so cool and then you can watch the expert on your laptop on your tablet whatever you want to use through on demand ah. and and then of course with a photo or however you wanted to to prove that you did the workout then of course you submit it so you can always be a rough rider once a rough rider always a rough oh, rider wow. so she kept going okay. yeah exactly so the on-demand program and that's still going now that yeah. is still something that you can do because we're still not at full capacity yeah so to answer your question on how we deal with it at the beginning when the studios first opened there were only seven bikes in a room and now that's gone up to 18 bikes But full capacity is actually 36. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So okay. we're actually only operating at half now. The The bikes are all distanced. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Uh, we wear masks before the ride and after the ride, not during. Yeah. 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 That would be torture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and we have a, a very good air filtering ventilation system within the room. Fans are on the whole time. And um, the front desk heroes is what we call the, the team that works at the front who welcomes all the clients. They do a fantastic job. They keep the studios sparkling. Yeah. Um, hand sanitizer, of course. All the showers are cleaned immediately after. Uh, really. And oh, they've just installed a new system where um, they, they track, I believe it works with, with temperature and, and they're just tracking that if you go in, then you get an, an alert as well. If someone's maybe the temperature is a bit high. Oh, and things wow. Like that. So that's brand new. That's from this week. Never heard of that yeah. before. Yeah. So that was in the last newsletter and there's information online about it if you want to find out more, but okay. they are really doing, um, a fantastic job with it really I have to say and it's taken very seriously all the experts also we encourage the use of masks we ask everyone and everyone's been really good with it yeah. actually and we say you know if you feel under the weather if you feel like you have a cold experts or clients or front desk heroes it doesn't matter we just say please don't come yeah, yeah. um just you know it's a responsibility to everybody that we all take care of each other um, and if an expert's feeling a little bit sick, a little bit of a runny nose or a sore throat, the call comes in and, and a substitute is found. Yeah. And that's the perks of having so many experts at the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I get that. I get that. Yeah, exactly. But um, we have not had, to my knowledge, we have not had one case of Corona. So we, something's working. That's yeah. so good. Okay. The last question about Ride Berlin, mm -hmm. how can people book a class? So uh, there's two options um, directly on the Ride Berlin website. Mm -hmm. You have to create an account and then you buy credits. And with the credits, you then book a class and um, you can get to know the experts a little bit. There's a bit of, an, of information about the experts. Um, their playlists are sometimes made available on the Ride Berlin Spotify account, oh, cool. which you can hear. So you get a bit of an idea of what you're signing up for. What kind of music do you have in your playlist? So it's funny, you know, ask me this in a separate question because that's kind of a okay. long answer. Okay, okay. Um, but let me quickly just yeah. finish with the booking and then um, you can pick the time, whatever works for you, or you can go through ClassPass. ClassPass yeah. is also an option. Okay. Yeah. Um, so for the music, okay, so this is a little bit tricky because I think it's maybe because I studied music that I think I overthink when it comes to music, right? <laughs> And I have not been able to not have a theme for my playlists. So 
it has to fit the theme. But I, okay, so first off, I'm not techno. I don't do hard techno or anything like that. Um, but I like it. I like a bit of a wobbly bass. Mm -hmm. I like a lot of synth. I like drums. It needs a strong rhythm and it needs a strong beat and um, high energy, but not stuff with like the high pitch stuff. Mm -hmm. I also want to make sure that it's music that I would listen to outside of the Ride Berlin Room because I think it, it lands a bit softer than when it's super hardcore. Don't get me wrong. I love those hardcore rides. I will go to those classes to change it up, to hear something different because it's, again, a different workout. I think the yeah. music has the power to change that workout. But for mine, I don't know why. I just can't not have a theme. So my first playlist was uh, Around the World where every song actually geographically worked where with every song we went more west until we went back to Germany. That's so cool. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it kind of worked perfectly actually. And I, I wanted to do it because the whole thinking behind it was no one's traveled this year. We're not doing what we would normally do. So let's travel through the music that we play for 50 minutes. So it starts in Brazil and then it goes around the world. Oh my God. Yeah. And I was, I was quite proud of that one. I really, and I, it's just so much fun. And um, I think, I think people enjoyed it. I mean, the feedback that I got was did you, positive. Did you tell them that you yes. were, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, because we also have the option, if we want to, we can also organize specials. Mm -hmm. And that will be either according to a holiday, a genre of music, or um, an artist. So um, most recently... Alex and Jeffrey, just yesterday, they did a double trouble. So they did 100 minutes of Missy Elliott versus Beyonce. Oh! Yeah, so wow. the whole playlist is Missy Elliott and Beyonce. Oh, cool. Um, Hubert, who's just one of the most delightful human beings you'll ever meet. He does so many specials. He's done a Drake special. He's done a, a J-Lo special, because everybody loves J-Lo. Um, he's done a Drake special. He's done a Justin Timberlake special. Uh, he's, he's the king of specials. Uh, we've had, we've got Pussycat Doll special coming up and I'm planning a Halloween special actually oh, wow. because I'm teaching on the 31st of October. So it's perfect. Ooh, wow. And the, the ride Berlin colors are black and orange. So I'm like, <laughs> it has to be, <laughs> um, Yeah, and then my second playlist actually ended up being a whole playlist of UK artists. And I didn't even plan it, but um, a lot of the artists are actually... So when you go to university in the UK for your bachelor's degree, you do this thing called Freshers' Week, which is just a week of pure debauchery. And it's just crazy because everyone's like, we've left home and we can do whatever we want and we can stay out as long as we want and drink as much alcohol. And it's nuts. It's such a crazy week, but it's so much fun. And there's themed nights and you dress up as a panda bear and then you dress up as, I don't know, like your halls of residence have a theme that they have to follow. Um, and it's just, it's, it's great and uh, a lot of the songs on on my second playlist were from freshers week so for me it was really fun because i was like oh i'm back in the club i'm 18 <laughs> that's so cool yeah and it's a whole bunch of uk artists and stuff like that so um and i've i've planned the next playlist is actually space themed um and i'm quite excited about that because my name is actually spelt it's alien with an a at the end <laughs> so i'm playing with that whole thing <laughs> i think i should call i should name the podcast alien with an a, a alien with an a at the end yeah exactly <laughs> yeah well i'm sure um finn will laugh because uh when the moment i met finn at the tsp he he it wasn't like a hi finn says Who are you? <laughs> and I and I said, um, I'm Aliena. And he goes, Oh, that's a that's a cool name. I've not heard that one before. And I said, Yeah, uh, you have to say it with enthusiasm. And he goes, Why? And I said, Because it's Aliena. <laughs> There's a yay in the middle of the name. <laughs> so 
So, yeah, because it's not a name that you find on a keychain or on a teacup or anything yeah. like that. So Not yet. No, not yet. <laughs> not yet. Yeah. But, um, yeah, the whole family, we kind of have a little bit obscure names. And so... Um, most people just call me Ali though because it's a lot easier yeah. and in German it's Aliena which so it's a little bit different but Aliena but no one ever really calls me by my full name either okay but, yeah <laughs> but I'm going with the space theme anyways <laughs> <laughs> I'm the alien yeah exactly <laughs> I love that idea all right is there anything that you want to add Before we start with the end of podcast questions. Okay. Um, about Ride Berlin, you mean? About you, about Ride Berlin, anything you want to add? Um, I think the one thing um, is that Ride Berlin is a kind of place where you can come and you can meet really interesting people. It sort of goes beyond just the sport and just the exercise and, and the, the, the fitness behind it. It actually goes further into... Uh, building friendships and and finding a group of people and that is what I loved about the training program so much it's a group of girls um we had two guys in the group as well and Emilio's just qualified whoop whoop and <laughs> um but it's a group of people who I can call and I can do things with that aren't just eating and drinking It's people who are motivated to do something active, who, um, you know, they're, they're open to trying things that they've not tried before. They're, they're interested in, in all sorts of things. And it's not just, oh, should we go for dinner? Or should we go for drinks? It's, should we go bouldering, for example? Or should we try this hit class? Or should we maybe try this? And there's just a little bit more... It's like you you open a door into a world that was always there, but you kind of forgot it was there. And, and it's a world that you feel more comfortable when you have someone to do it with yeah. than going in alone. Because the world of sports can be very intimidating if you don't look a certain way, if you don't have the right fitness level. And I know I'm one of those people who can get very intimidated to going to a, a hit class and they tell me to do 10 burpees and I think, oh my God, get me out of here because it's, you don't feel like you're either doing them properly or people are around you are just all doing them better and they're done faster than you and you're holding the group back and it's, you know, but if you have someone to do it with and you laugh about it and you have a good time and the whole experience changes for you and that's why I have so enjoyed really being a bigger part of that community because it's allowed me to have that again i absolutely understand that because i never did interval training my whole life and i started running and i thought oh i just like running i don't want to do the interval stuff mm -hmm. i don't care if i'm fast or if i'm not fast but i was always thinking about the craft runners because that's what they do they do interval training and i was like okay no next year next week yeah. or whatever somewhere And uh, last Tuesday was the first time that I joined them. Amazing. And I really, really enjoyed it. And I was impressed how I felt because it was so different. Yeah. And I wouldn't have done it if another friend of mine, I, I mean, I'm running with the Midnight Runners. That's a running mm -hmm. crew here in Berlin. And one of the captains from the Midnight Runners were at the Craft Runners. Mm. And he pushed me to run even faster. Yeah. We are not going to talk about my <laughs> sore muscles for the last couple of days, but I felt amazing. Yeah. And it was so interesting to feel this different way of like, I'm running, but not the normal, like yeah. how I normally do it. Yeah. And it's just so nice that you still do the same sport. Yeah. But it's just a completely different yeah. feeling. And then you have a group of people to do it with. And I think True. that's what's so nice because you're going through... At the end of the day, it's it's a process of changing your body, right? And when you go through an intensive training program, you, you take huge pride in actually recognizing what your body is capable of, right? Yeah. And it's a super cool feeling to not just see, but to actually feel yourself gain strength or gain speed or gain stamina and to be able to relate to someone going through the same thing 
that's a powerful connection and that's a powerful relationship and that is going to sustain you for a really long time it gives you a lot more I think and I think the relationships that you build around doing something active or doing something centered on sports are wonderful friendships to have and they they're the ones that you carry with you yeah Mm. I love that Mm. (laughs) okay I have three more oh no actually four more questions okay hit me first of all uh, where can people find you do you have Instagram or something I am on the gram yeah Um, it's a new one for the ride account and it's (laughs) so it's again play play on my name right so it's a yay hey because my last name is Haig so a y dot y a y dot h e y when i when i saw your instagram name for the first time i was like what this is so cool <laughs> <laughs> but now you are now, yeah. now you know a little bit more about my name so it's yeah. a yay because ali yay na and then haig because it kind of it kind of works yeah. and i thought well i'm being really cool and creative by doing this yeah i'll we'll put it in the show notes <laughs> if the people are a bit confused so a yay hey yeah okay perfect um so now a book that inspired you a book that inspired me I love books. I have to ask. Okay. That. <laughs> All right. Um, in any context or in a sporting context? Oh, no. It's any context. Matter, yeah. Okay. There is a... Well, actually, you'll probably... You have to read this book if you haven't read it already. Um, it's a guy called... It's written by Yves Chomard, who's the guy from... He's the, the founding father of Patagonia. The At sports... The yeah, yeah, yeah. This book is called Let My People Go Surfing. And it was recommended to me by a very, very good friend of mine called Lisa. And uh, she is my walking library, basically. (laughs) (laughs) And this book is amazing because to me, this guy has all his priorities set up perfectly. And he has never sold out to the corporate world. And not only do I have tons of respect for Patagonia now since reading this book but it's also about how you develop it goes way beyond the corporate culture as well it's actually just what you what you cherish what you um and that you you are the things that you find important and the the good that you want to do in the world there is a place to develop it and a place where that can be successful and he is living proof of that and it's a fiction uh, obviously a non-fiction book but it's it's written with a bit of heart and his background is in rock climbing and his one thing is you leave the place the way you found it and i think if everybody in the world would leave the places that they visit inhabit spend five minutes in if they leave it the way they found it we wouldn't be in the situation <laughs> that we're in now and i think What we have lost in the last century is respect for each other, for the environment, and for ourselves. And I think it's really, really sad. And what Patagonia has done and what Eve specifically managed to do was build a multi-million company and prove corporate world totally wrong that you don't have to sell your soul you don't have to play the dirty rules that everybody plays by and by doing good by developing quality by not if you can't meet the deadline because the product isn't good enough that is a totally valid reason to not meet the deadline right it's not because uh uh-oh we're gonna miss millions of dollars it's because it's not good enough and it's we shouldn't be putting it out there if it's not ready to be put out there, right? I mean, let's use that logic with the coronavirus vaccine. How about that, right? <laughs> and it's and you just think it's so simple. It's so yeah. easy. And it was just such a fantastic book. Everyone needs to read this book um, because you can make it happen if you know where your moral compass is, you know the direction you want to go, you stick to what you believe in and you don't let anybody tell you that you're wrong. It's wonderful. I love that. I didn't know that he was, that he wrote a book. Mm, yeah. Nice. 
Yeah. I was actually thinking about buying a jacket a couple of years ago because mm. I knew that they do like recycling stuff mm -hmm. and I wanted to do something good. Yeah. But And yeah. what's really cool about Patagonia is that if it um, breaks, like a zipper comes off, yeah. you take it to the shop and they fix it for you. Oh, cool. You don't have to buy a new jacket or you don't have to give it away. You can give it back to them, but they will actually also just fix the jacket for you. Have you ever heard of uh, Scott Jurek, the uh, ultra marathon runner? No. He is really popular in America okay. and his wife is actually a designer for Patagonia. Ah, yeah. yeah. See, I really like what they do as well with their ambassadors and they... Um, They also are releasing documentaries slowly. I need to do more research into Patagonia and I should be a bigger fan, really, especially after reading that book. I, but um, I know that they, there's one ambassador whose name I don't remember, but he's based in Tasmania and he does a lot for um, ocean conservation and things like this. But they, they'll use, you know, big surfers or big snowboarders and big athletes in their own right, mm -hmm. but who are also caring for the environment and things yeah. like that. And, and everything, the, the whole ethos of the company, it just for me is... Um, well a like obvious every company should be like that and it's sad that the the companies we all fight over to try and get in because the salaries are good or because the reputation or whatever mm. you know they actually a lot of them play really dirty and you know what do you sacrifice by working for people like that That's a whole other podcast. That's, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was thinking the same, <laughs> but I absolutely agree with you. Mm. Um, the next question is... Tell me. What excites you in the morning? What excites it? Coffee. <laughs> really? Oh, my God. I, I think I need to change this question because everyone is saying coffee. Oh, really? Finn said I coffee. coffee. <laughs> All of us said coffee. Everyone. I was like, <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, oh, man. Um, what excites me? In no, the but why coffee? You can't. Why co I it's love fine. coffee. I just love coffee. And it's funny, I can have a coffee and go straight to sleep. It's not, and it's not um, coming from a place of where I'm addicted to coffee. I just genuinely love coffee. I do, love the do taste of coffee. Do you believe that I don't have coffee in my apartment? Mm. <laughs> I don't drink coffee. Uh, no, but I think, it, I mean... <laughs> fine all good more for me that means you're not taking it from the shelves right it's awesome um i just there's also there's like a whole culture around coffee that i just love as well but i love taking the time in the morning and i will wake up half an hour early just so that i can have a coffee because it's it's more than just drinking the coffee it's also that i can sit in the windowsill and I can journal or I can read or I can listen to an album or a podcast or I can read the news, whatever I feel like doing. There's always a coffee there next to me. And, and it's not that, oh my God, I need coffee. It's I so enjoy having this coffee. And I get that. Um, <laughs> it's my little moment. It's my, my little 15 minutes, whole hour Whatever it is. Me time. It's it's my me time. And yeah. my me time includes a coffee. It, also sometimes in the afternoon. or. I, I mean, I have the same with the hot chocolate or matcha. Mm. These are my... Mm. See? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, I just genuinely love a coffee. I just... The taste and... Um, and I don't even find that it... A lot of people, you know, they get a bit shaky if they've had two or three. I have four or five, six coffees a day. <gasps> Whoa. Yeah. So but I'm... Like, I can't say that it makes me shaky yeah. or that it, it alters how I feel. Yeah. A lot of people have said, my mom said she had the same and it all changed after uh, being pregnant. Okay. So, you know, I yeah, it's, yeah. haven't had a kid yet, so <laughs> 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 maybe, maybe I shouldn't if I love coffee so much. <laughs> all right. So the last question for today. Okay. One thing that everyone should know not about you just in general or could be about you but just one so. thing everyone should know i mean we already had a good a couple of good ones in this conversation but is there something in particular that you want to point out <sighs> wow can i think about that can yeah. i have i didn't, i really need to think about that because there's so much and one thing everyone should know I think everyone should know 
okay let me set the context because i think also talking as girls um you don't have to do what society tells you to do um I have this conversation a lot and even more so recently that you know you okay it's it's kind of two things because it's it's almost like if you don't have a boyfriend are you even a girl <laughs> <laughs> and then if you're not in a relationship buying a house getting a mortgage being engaged and having a kid by 30 I mean, is your life so off track, right? And I actually feel less of that in Berlin. But I have now lived in more countries by myself than I did with my parents. I have been single for seven years. And I wouldn't have had it any other way, really. I am not attached to anybody. And it makes me sound super disloyal which I'm not, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I had so many more opportunities and experiences because I didn't do what I was quote unquote supposed to do, right? And I love my parents for that reason because they're like, what do you want to get married for? I, like, wait until you're at least 30, right? And I just think also with everything that's happened this year and finding sport again and... um you know, whatever it is, you, you fulfill yourself in different ways. And I think it's really important to know that whatever it is that you decide to do, if your family doesn't like it, if your friends disagree with you, first off, then they're not real friends. And, and if society says, uh oh, you're doing it all wrong. No, you're not. You're doing it exactly right for you. And that is the that is the direction that you need to follow and to trust and your gut always knows best. And um, having that supportive community around you is not something that you you should ever um, it, it, it kind of just happens organically, right? And it's and it's also like it's almost, if you're going to have a relationship just to be in a relationship, right? I think that's totally the wrong attitude. And it's also having a friendship just for the sake of having the friendship. That's also wrong. You know, you, you these things take their time and everyone works to their own speed and their own pace. And um, I would say that that's something I've learned. And looking back on these last seven years, they've been amazing. They've been really amazing. And I have the conversation all the time. Why are you single? Why are you not with a guy? Why don't you have a house? Why don't you do that? Because I don't want to. And I'm not going to be with some guy just to be with a guy. <laughs> I make myself happy. I earn my own money. I do my own exercise. I take care of myself. Yeah, I got bumps and bruises because I run into things all the time. But that's okay. You're right. And um, I know it's not and it's not very profound, but I think it's important, especially coming from girls that, again, the Ride Berlin girls, that is a supportive community. And it doesn't matter what you think, what you feel, it's supportive. And it's, it's belief in the, the person and, and believing that they know what's best for themselves, right? It's like an inherent trust in them knowing And then that reflects back on you. And I think that that makes you stand a lot more firmly on your own two feet. And um, and it it brings back that respect that we've lost. Because when you respect yourself, you automatically get respect from other people. And I think that goes a really long way in how you affect the people who know you, how you affect your surroundings because um, what you give out is what you get back. Sweet. Is what I would say. <laughs> I don't know if that's what you were going for. If you wanted like a fun fact. I don't want anything. Um, okay. I'm just always really interested in 
in this question and what people think so thank you so much you're welcome thank you so much for your time for your energy yeah. for your smile thank you for the invitation this has been so great i really really appreciate it thank you for asking me to be a part of it always a pleasure i can't wait to see you again and to see where it takes you and where you will ride with your bike oh thank you yeah i can't see just can't wait to see you in the ride room <laughs> I'm super excited for your that. bike is waiting for you it's not going anywhere <laughs> thank you thank you Thank you so much for tuning in with me today. Make sure to let me know how this episode resonated with you by tagging me under at Eliza Licious Show over on Instagram. That's where you can also send me a DM if you have any questions or suggestions. If you want to know more, make sure to head over to elizalicious.de where you can find the show notes for each episode. And please make sure to pop over to iTunes and leave me a rating and review. And hey, If you like what you hear, check out my Patreon page where you can support my work. I appreciate that so, so much. Big thank you to Tanya Nocella for graphics and music by Temple Hayes. Have a wonderful rest of the day and I'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.